big shout out to Ahmad Mjarek, who is the speaker in the following uh, recording, an excerpt of the online conversation titled um, Race, Science, Physical Anthropology and the Ethnographic Museum, hosted by uh, Wayne Modest of the Dutch National Museum of World Cultures. Um, yeah, if... Uh, I, I, I don't own this, all right? Um, and if you, someone feels that um, this shouldn't be posted like this on this website, then um, please contact me and uh, uh, we'll have it taken off for it. Right, if you have any comments, uh, please message me. Yeah. If I if I remember correctly, the question was, is race real or what is race? It seems that the people that are asking me this question, they are really looking for reassurance because there is lots of um, buzz going on about the existence of race. They are looking for comfort, that there's nothing there in nature, nothing deep down in our bodies that supports the persistence of racism in society, that could support the persistence of racism in society. And this question is, of course, understandable. But I should tell you that each time I start to answer this question, I tend to stutter. I, um, uh, I stumble over my words because the question itself seems very simple. There is no such thing as race. Yet it is full with ambiguities. There are uh, to be found these ambiguities in the two words biology and race. And neither of these words can be taken for granted. Neither of these words can be reduced to one singular entity. So, for example, biology. Uh, it is not a matter of genes or bones or a matter of hormones. It is not a matter of adding up all these different um, uh, elements in our, in our bodies, um, um, bones, skin color and what have you. The biological is perhaps best viewed, I would say, as a configuration, configuration of scientific work, where theories, methods, materials such as samples, chemicals, devices are configured to present an assumed natural phenomenon. So as if it is just there. And this phenomena is not less valid or less true or less important in our lives. By contrast, the point is that it is irreducible to one thing. The power of the truth to claim, uh, maybe its, its value and its val validity, is precisely the fact that it is a meticulous configuration. Now, for example, I could not convince you of the existence of the melanin gene, so the gene that is responsible for our skin colors, by making you stare at your skin. As many anthropologists of science have shown, we need a laboratory to do that. The gene is not simply in your body, in my body, but exists in the connection between bodily materials, between books, journals, labs, samples and data. This allows us to study, to act upon, to determine whether it is mutated or not, or whether it is the cause for cancerous, cancerous cells, etc. So the gene is configured even when it seems independent and self-contained. And then this other word, race. Now, race had long been a prime working horse in studies of human diversity. And since the late 19th century, the prospect of finding the racial type has driven feverish collections of data. And you've seen some of uh, the examples in Angelic's uh, presentation. Um, in the slip stream of colonial projects and equipped with novel statistical methods, scientists started to measure length, skin color, hair shape, hair structure, iris color, lip thickness, ear form, fingerprints, the shape of prints of hands, of foot, and so on and so forth. Books and upon books and upon books have been written about all these variables. More details, better methods, larger data sets would determine once and for all what the human racial type were. Or so the story went. 
But exactly, and ironically, as the data accumulated, it became clear. Race was an illusion. It could not be pinpointed down to real existing human bodies. But the very idea of race was also doing work in society. Assumed hierarchies where the white man figured as the crown, uh, crowning glory of evolution, these, were, these figures were mobilized to justify injustice, to justify colonial extractions, to justify killings, slavery, humiliations. One could say that this demand for race and race differences in society, the justification of injustice by reference to assumed facts out there in nature, has kept race uh, science alive. For you all know that in the aftermath of the Second World War in 1951, the UNESCO issued a statement on race, indicated that there is, despite all these books that have been written, all these data that have been collected, that there is no biological basis for race. And throwing this anti-racist stone surely got the bond of science and society to the ripple. However, this doesn't mean that the preoccupation with biological race has come to an end. And as some of you might know, there have, been, there have always been some pockets of racist science supported and financed ever since the early 60s by wealthy, for example, anti, uh, anti-abolitionists. More importantly, where genetic research has uh, produced ample evidence for the non-existence of race, race is definitely making a comeback in mainstream science, and uh, Wayne has alluded to that at the beginning. Now, it is key to note that the influence of science, the, the, the influence of science, the, of the science of difference, especially genetics, on almost all aspects of society, and that this um, influence is really overwhelming. And I'm sure you have your examples, and one could uh, say that both race and genetics are in demand in that respect. The world of policing, for example, had changed dramatically with the advent of forensic DNA. And I've heard many policemen say, well, if you don't have DNA, you'd rather, you'd rather not go to court. Eh? Medical practice is completely transformed. The field of archaeology and of history is reinventing itself with the advent of DNA. Millions of citizens are sending their swabs to learn more about their genetic ancestry, to learn more about uh, genetic predispositions for diseases or other kinds of um, characteristics. And even your political inclination, your preferred workout or sport, your food preferences are said to be a matter of genetic now, despite um, a kind of hubris, a kind of neoliberal individuality that this might presuppose, genetics could also give us a pause to be more um, um, uh, a modest, so to speak. Or um, So when the human genome uh, was completed in the early uh, 20s, this is a collection of genes that we as human beings have, or any kind of organism for that matter. So when it was completed in the early 20s, it was a kind of shock when it was determined that we humans had no more than 25,000 genes. So we have billions of um, DNA building blocks, but only 25,000 uh, genes. Now the fruit fly has 13,000 genes. And can you imagine the dismay? It was really a big disappoint disappointment. This cannot be true because we were, um, uh, how to say that we were sort of uh, the human gene almost sold us like, you know, we are, our genes are so important to us, we all know more than a pack of genes and we need to know what we are and who we are through the genes. So as universal man, that is the white European, had put himself on the top of the evolutionary ladder, the ladder, the assumption had always been more is better, larger brains, more chromosomes, and this was another uh, historical moment when chromosomes were seen under the microscope and there was this moment where women might have more chromosomes than men. Uh, in the end, it turned out we have equal uh, amount of chromosomes, but the white chromosome is very tiny, the male sex chromosome, so it was overlooked initially. So that was really another moment of nervousness. And uh, so more is better, and more genes were, of course, expected, but finding out that the millions of years of evolutionary time that separates universal man from the fruit fly has resulted in only 12,000 genes of difference was really a hard one to swallow. But these are the facts. So we have also learned that reducing ourselves to this bag of genes that I was talking about does not make sense. And not only do environmental variables play a huge role in how our bodies function, 
but also the concept of our body in itself is problematic. Now our own cells, the cells that in which our DNA can be found, are really outnumbered by trillions and trillions of bacterial cells. Bacterial cells outnumber human cells by 10 to 1, uh, to make it very clear. And in addition to this, I think one of the achievements of recent genetic research is indeed that it has demonstrated almost on a daily basis that there are no innate differences between human groups. Um, it is all probabilistics, uh, all genes are distributed among different kinds of groups across the world, and it is a very, very complicated picture that we have there. So why then do I claim that race is making a comeback? Now first, while most genetic research teaches that differences are probabilistic and cannot be pinpoint, pinpointed to specific groups of individuals, as these results start to circulate, social categories are mobilized to do precisely that, to create these groups. This conflation of statistical distribution with social categorization, which happened in science and society, renders the fluid categories of genetics rigid again. And perhaps we can call these categorical alignments, different categories that are aligned together, which is a concept of Steve Epstein in his beautiful book, Inclusion. A second reason that can be sought in the fact that the persistence of social problems in society, so crime, poverty, and what have you, and the enormous interest in the life sciences as our salvage, is it is assumed that this life science will finally provide us then with the answer, which contributes to the extra bio or, or to the biological of social categories. So here you see then that the demand for race um, uh, is, is, is really uh, also something that happens outside the laboratory because it provides race provides a compelling explanation now to uh, conclude just two um, uh, short observations that i would like to share with you in addition maybe they could be helpful for the, for the discussion further because i've been thinking of some of the uh, questions that wayne put to us and one of them um, is about the you know, race in, in, in history and, and, and race in our society. Uh, so the difference then between the way race figured in the field of physical anthropology between before the Second World War, that is before the dominant role that population genetics and its probabilistic approaches to difference and diversity. Uh, so in that in, the, in that older era, at the difference between then and now, the ways uh, race that plays uh, a role in our day research, I think. Um, I would like to suggest uh, this there. The pre-war focus had been on, I would say, on race as the object of research. Race was geared towards finding the racial type out there in nature and to characterize that, uh, that type in order to uh, place it properly on the evolutionary uh, ladder, but also to assign its place in society. And uh, the examples of the Gens and the really showing that very beautifully. Now, in contrast, I would say, in current day science practice, race is not so much the object of research, I mean, in, in the mainstream, right? Not so much the object of, um, uh, of research, but rather the method. It is to say that, uh, to, to put it with uh, Jonathan Kahn, race in the meantime. Race is here used as a classificatory category. Uh, however you want to define that, to help make, in Dutch we say, to make chocolate out of the messy data, to make chocolate out of the messy data, um, uh, to, to, to order the method, to, to put order in the mess. It helps scientists to structure huge amount of data, to make that data relevant, or to be uh, more convincing, because by introducing race to the data, it seems to, seems to make more sense. They become, the data, the, uh, the, the results become more uh, graspable. Uh, and thus the argument uh, more convincing uh, because it hooks in with our folk uh, knowledge about differences in society. Now, the second and very short observation that I want to um, say here, or maybe that is the provocation uh, that I want to put forward, is um, has to do with social construction of race. And um, so I would like to say that I find it less and less convincing to say, well, race is, is, is socially constructed as a kind of default, a default answer. Uh, I think we can do better than that. I think we need to question the obvious, namely race, and, and Wayne just did, uh, before he gave me the floor, so to speak, uh, address that. So what exactly is race? 
um, uh, what is race uh, is a question that needs to be asked not to find a kind of a, a conclusive definition to it or a conclusive answer but rather to specify again and again where is it happening and what shape does it uh, does it take so social construction gives us sometimes the impression that it is something that is just a matter of perspective or a matter of speech which is all true but I think what we can learn from museum practice actually is the kind of sedimented nature of, uh, of race. So how uh, this knowledge, this uh, historical knowledge about race is has materialized, not so much in bodies, but rather in the practices, in the material environments uh, that surround these bodies. In, um, uh, I mean, in scientific practice, these are the methods and the tools and the examples and the uh, uh, theories that have been uh, uh, collected. But it, you could also think about the database, the bureaucratic registries, the posit uh, repository, so race is, uh, is a materialized history that does not belong to the past, but is among us doing its work. Thank you.